Friends have asked me for years to write down this story, and I have finally agreed now that I am only a few weeks away from retirement. I have worked as a social worker for the past 30 years in the New York City borough of Brooklyn. The job was incredibly stressful, but I know for a fact that I improved the lives of dozens of families. There was a point, about 13 years ago, which nearly caused me to say fuck it and walk away from the profession. I still deal with the lingering effects of post-traumatic stress disorder from this period of my life. I hope that writing all of this down will help me finally put this case to rest so that I can enjoy retirement. The fall of the Soviet Union gave childless American couples the opportunity to adopt needy, white children. Thousands upon thousands of children from Russia and Eastern Europe were adopted in New York during the 1990s and 2000s. And I would say that a vast majority of these adoptions produced genuinely happy families. The children were excited to have loving families, and the adoptive parents were excited to have a child to love. I was adopted. So I took a natural interest in any social welfare cases that involved adopted children. Some children had difficulty transitioning to life in the United States, while others were victims of abuse. Almost every adoptive case I worked with had a happy ending. Every adoptive case except for one. But I hesitate to say that the child in question was actually a child. Sometimes I think that I legitimately was dealing with pure evil in human form. The Pulaskis were a young, successful couple living in Brooklyn and commuting to their jobs in Manhattan. They had it all, wealth, good looks, charm, and generosity. I could go on and on about these two. The husband, Ryan, worked on Wall Street while the wife, Jenny, worked at a marketing firm a couple of blocks away. They had everything but a child, as they had been unable to conceive despite trying for three years. Ryan's great-grandfather immigrated from Russia in the early 20th century, so Ryan and Jenny decided to look to Russia for a child to adopt. They worked through a local Russian Orthodox church to facilitate the adoption which told them that they had the perfect child in mind. An eight-year-old boy named Dimitri, with blonde hair and blue eyes, was looking for a home. Both Ryan and Jenny took two weeks off from work and flew off to Moscow to meet with Dimitri. They learned that Dimitri appeared outside a church at the age of three. His records were suspiciously vague, but the Pulaskis were charmed by the boy's good looks and grasp of the English language. They filled out the necessary paperwork and agreed to return in one month to occupy Dimitri back to the States. Over the course of the next month, they excitedly prepared for Dimitri's arrival. When Ryan and Jenny landed at the airport in Moscow, they were surprised to find Dimitri, accompanied by two police officers, waiting for them. The smaller police officer stepped towards the Pulaskis and said in halting English, Russia is grateful for your generosity. As a way to show our appreciation, we have arranged for you to take the next flight out of Moscow, which leaves in one hour. Your hotel reservation was already cancelled. Ryan and Jenny looked at one another in confusion. Jenny stepped forward and said, what happened to the priest we met with last time? We were expecting to meet in the same church as last time. Dimitri spoke up and said in flawless English, It's okay, Mommy. My time here is done. Let's leave now. Ryan later told me that he should have followed his gut and demanded to meet with the proper authorities to figure out what was going on. However, youth inexperience, and being in a foreign country led them to go along with the situation. They had never failed at anything before in their lives, 
and they weren't going to let Russian bureaucracy ruin their plans of having a child. So they took Dmitri back to New York intent on creating a perfect family. The Pulaskis did everything right. They enrolled their child in the most expensive private school in New York, hired a therapist experienced in working with adopted children, and spent every minute of their free time with Dimitri. Their first year as a family seemed to be perfect to any outside observer. Dimitri proved to be incredibly gifted, and his teachers remarked that he was the most intelligent student they had ever had. His therapist also noted Dimitri's intelligence and said that Dimitri seemed to be the perfect child. Ryan and Jenny weren't so convinced. They discovered that Dimitri routinely snuck out of the house at night. He would wait until they were asleep to leave and return just before morning. They tried to discuss the issue with Dimitri but he denied it all while wearing a slight smile on his face. Ryan and Jenny became even more concerned when Ryan observed Dimitri practicing different facial expressions in front of the mirror. Dimitri would put on an expression of happiness and then shift to one of sadness, then to one of concern, then terror. In between each expression, his face would appear dead devoted of all emotion. After that first year, they decided to switch Dimitri's therapist. He would now see a behavioral therapist as well as a psychiatrist. Both the behavioral therapist and psychologist sensed that something was off with Dimitri. They advised the Pulaskis to deadbolt the doors to their house at night and keep the only keys with them so that Dimitri could not sneak out. Dimitri did not respond well to this increased restriction and began to show his true nature. Dimitri started to manipulate the other children at his school. He would get them to fight one another with scissors and pens, which resulted in a three-week suspension. Jenny was forced to stay home from work to monitor Dimitri. We don't know exactly what happened during that time, but Jenny had a mental breakdown and was committed to a psychiatric hospital. Cigarette burns were found on the bottom of her feet by doctors. Whether they were self-inflicted or done by Dimitri is something we will never know. The school allowed Dimitri to return to school after Ryan made a large donation. He was expelled four weeks later. When authorities learned that Dimitri had convinced two other students to make false molestation charges against the school principal, this is where I got involved. Child Protective Services were called after the students first reported the claims of abuse. The students kept to their story for a week out of fear of Dimitri. However, the students eventually told the truth to their parents which exonerated the principal. The students claimed that Dimitri had threatened to cut their hands off if they did not make the reports of abuse. They said that Dimitri had pulled a severed human hand out of his bag as proof of what he would do. Three police officers and I visited the home of the Pulaskis to interview Dimitri, as well as search the home. A severed human hand was indeed found, as well as a collection of prescription eyeglasses wallets, watches, and car keys. They asked Dimitri where he had gotten these items and he responded that he found them in Ryan's room one day while he was away at work. The officers immediately went to search the master bedroom while Ryan sputtered in disbelief. The police found a bloody kitchen knife as well as a taser under his bed. They arrested Ryan immediately on suspicion of murder leaving me with Dimitri. I called my supervisor and volunteered to care for Dimitri until this mess could be sorted out. I regret that decision to this day. Dimitri wore a lopsided grin for the entire ride back to my house. Every attempt I made at starting a conversation with him was met with silence. Not that surprising considering what he had been through. 
I introduced him to my wife and two daughters and let them know that he would be staying with us for a few days while we worked on a more permanent living situation. The next morning, I got a call from the detective leading the investigation against Ryan. He wanted me to bring Dimitri in to speak with him immediately. When we got to the station, the detective pulled me aside and said, All of those items we found at the Pulaski's residence are linked to six brutal murders from the past year. I said, Has Ryan Pulaski confessed yet? Never would have suspected he was capable of anything like that. The detective paused, glanced over his shoulder at Dimitri, and whispered to me, It wasn't Ryan. His alibis for the night of each murder check out. His fingerprints are on the kitchen knife, yeah, but only because it's from his kitchen. Fingerprints on everything else, as well as surveillance footage from one of the murders point to a different suspect. I said, okay, good, so Dimitri can go home with Ryan. The detective looked at me sharply and said, you're not getting it. Dimitri isn't going anywhere. We have video evidence that shows him using the taser on a man and then pulling him into the alley where the body was found. Don't ask me how an eight-year-old did that, but we're charging him. He then left to take a phone call in another room. For a moment, I couldn't think. I watched as two officers approached Dimitri and attempted to place him under arrest. A look of pure rage crossed his face as he pulled out a small knife from under his sweater and managed to stab one of the police officers before another officer knocked him out with a blow to the head. That monster had slept in my house. I slowly turned to leave and pulled out my phone to check the time. I saw nine missed calls from my wife. I remember a feeling of pure dread wash over me. I stood there, frozen in place. My wife had never called my phone so many times before. She knew that I turned it on silent when out on business and would wait until I returned the first missed call. The detective tapped me on the shoulder and the expression on his face told me everything. He took me back to his office and I collapsed into his seat. I didn't want to hear what he had to say. To delay him, I asked him for a cup of coffee. He came back, closed the door, and said, You're... your youngest daughter. He continued, Your youngest daughter was found hanging from the ceiling this morning by your wife. It wasn't suicide. Her hands were bound behind her back. Dimitri is obviously the main suspect, but we have no idea at this time how he managed to hoist your daughter who is more than twice his size. I took a leave of absence from work for an entire year to deal with the aftermath. I went to Dimitri's trial. I tried to get them to sentence him as an adult, but they wouldn't. Some bullshit about him being too young to know what he was doing. They conveniently ignored all the psychiatric and intelligence tests, which showed he had cognitive abilities better than most adults. I suspect that the Russian authorities knew exactly what Dmitri was capable of. They used the adoption system as a way to push the problem onto someone else. Dmitri turns 21 tomorrow and will be released from the high security psychiatric hospital he has been held at. I'm getting the hell out of New York City, and I pray the police keep a close eye on him. Hey guys, thank you all for watching my video, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and join the Nightmare Army. I'm always looking for new soldiers in my Nightmare Nation. I'd like to give a big thank you to Riley Weedler for letting me narrate his story off of his website, Little Creepy Stories. If you guys haven't, please check out his website. He's got a lot of really creepy stories on there that he wrote. I honestly think that he's a fantastic writer, and I definitely think you guys will enjoy his stories. Above all, guys, it's Friday. <laughs> so what's everybody doing for the weekend? I know for the past, I think, hour and a half, I've been watching Goosebumps while I was editing the video. That's how I spend my Fridays now. <laughs> I honestly sound like such a nerd right now. <laughs> 
But anyways, guys, I'm sorry this story is a bit uh, short for you guys. I've been uploading a lot of long stories, so I figured it was nice to switch things up a bit. But anyways, guys, thank you all for watching, and just remember, the best ideas always come out of nightmares.